Welcome to our colloquium today. Um, I am actually in Halloween costume. Uh, I'm, I'm dressed up as a physics professor, which I usually am not, as my colleagues will attest to. So, um, Today we're very happy to welcome Ibrahim Abba uh, from John Hopkins University. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan in 2012, and after postdocs in California and France, two of the best places on earth. Uh, he joined the faculty at Johns Hopkins University as an assistant professor in 2017. Uh, Ibu's general interests in theoretical high energy physics are in theoretical high energy physics and cosmology. He explores the relations between quantum field theories, string theories, and gravity via the framework of holography. He's also interested in fundamental aspects of black holes and their role in nature. And his work is part of a larger research program uh, whose main goal is to understand the quantum theory of gravity. In today's talk, he will discuss aspects of the microscopic degrees of freedom of gravity as motivated by string theory. Was that an accurate assessment? Definitely. Okay, excellent. Thank, Thank you, you very much. It's great to have you. Thank you, Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to visit uh, Brown. Um, okay, so the topic is topological stars and gravity. Hopefully, these terms will make sense by the end um, of the talk. Uh, to sort of start off with why uh, the motivations of, 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 of some broad motivations here. So black holes have been very exciting and interesting for several decades, and in fact, going back all the way to when GR was first discovered, um, but the exciting part recently is we can hear them, we can see them from LIGO, from EHT uh, imaging, and in the future, there's Einstein's telescopes and Cosmic Explorer and LISA. So there'll be a huge boom in the study of black holes, or what I will refer to as uh, co compact objects uh, uh, in physics. So this excitement is, you know, is so, is, is best encapsulated, for example, just in the recent uh, five years, we have had two Nobel Prizes that were given towards the study of black holes. First, the gravitational waves, and then observations and predictions um, uh, in, in 2020, 20, 2020. So, however, um, it, it, even before we sort of start to get, get, get into these points, um, really what these experiments are going to do, they're going to be seen as sort of uh, gravitational spectroscopy for ultra-compact objects. Okay, and I'll try to be more precise what I mean by that. And to this end, uh, it is important to point out we do we don't know what is the spectrum of ultra compact objects in theories of gravity. So whatever these machines will see, we are we have yet to understand theoretically what they should be. Um, and relating to this is what are the degrees of freedom that should characterize black holes, which is still an outstanding problem in in, in physics, which I will try to explain. So first, a brief review of, of what we mean by gravity. So in, in general relativity, we think of gravity as actually coming from the curvature of space-time. So the Earth has high energy density. It curves space-time. The moon follows a geodesic around it, which is not going to be a straight line, but going to be some elliptical orbit, as, uh, as we know and love. And the fun thing about this is the more dense the object that you have, the larger the curvature, and at some point, the curvatures can be so large that you, the GR predicts a singularity or puncture in the space-time. Um, the point here to, is important to distinguish, the fact that you have a puncture in space-time or a singularity is, is, is the fact that GR itself is breaking down, not actual uh, what space-time is. Usually in physics, whenever you have a singular thing appear is because you have extra degrees of freedom that you must account for, or you have new physics to understand. So the fact that you have this singularity is GR itself telling you that there should be new physics that should enter into the picture in this regime. One of the in exciting things, however, about nature is while you can have these horrible singularities, um, if you study GR and gravity, you find that they are always going to be hidden behind a horizon. There is always going to be a screen which hides these horrible uh, features from, from, from the outside, outside world. And you, can, you might imagine that there might be a physical processes that leads to such a singularity, but any sort of reasonable physical system will actually always lead to singularity, to, to, sort of, to, to horizons that would shield 
such a singularity. So this is a completely different talk, completely different game we can play to actually show that horizons always form when you, when you make black hole sort of object. So a great deal of study of black holes come from trying to understand the physics of a horizon and what it entails and, 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 and what sorts of things can be learned from them. So for example, one of the incredible surprises is that you imagine matter falls and makes a black hole like a star. A star has many different degrees of freedom, have all sorts of physical characteristics to just distinguish them. No two stars are the same, and you can make this very sharp. However, when they make a black hole, black holes are very pure objects. Okay. Thank you. So black holes are objects that are very, very, very pure in a sense that they only require three numbers. They're, they seem quite elementary, as elementary as elementary particles. They only have three numbers that completely characterizes their state from the classical point of view. Okay? This is, again, from the classical point of view. If, you, if I give you the charge, the mass, and the angular momentum, I have fully characterized the black hole the, that I want to think about. So contrast this to the complicated objects such as a star that collapses to, to, to make this. So with this said, of course, um, the, when I try to think about features of the horizon, there is something that was learned some time ago, which first emerged as an analogy, but an analogy that, that, that sort of became something quite fundamental in, in black hole physics. First, even though black holes are labeled by very few parameters, they're, in, in GR, you can show that they behave almost as thermodynamic. They behave as thermodynamic objects. Meaning, if I make the following substitution, I take the surface gravity, which is the strength of gravity on the, at the horizon. So this would be like 9.8 meters per second squared. And I take the mass of the black hole as energy, the area as the horizon, the, the area of the horizon as entropy. You can take angular momentum as pressure. You find that they satisfy laws of thermodynamics. And you, in fact, you can prove a zero law, a first law, a second law, and a third law of black hole thermodynamics. Uh, for general relativity, purely from the equation, as robust as you might want. Go ahead. Uh, what do you have to the zeroth law? So the zeroth law is the existence of temperature in equilibrium. In equilibrium, you have temperature. So in equilibrium, you the surface gravity is uniform. Good. Um, and so as a thermodynamic object, if you try to consider quantum effect around the black hole, you find that it radiates via Hawking radiation. So this is a sort of a thing that pushes the analogy to something being much more physically meaningful, that there is some physical, there is a sharp way of think of, to, to somehow think of the black hole as some average quantity, some ensemble quantity uh, in, in, of some physical system. Whatever such a physical system is, you can try to think about what it is. And one way to sort of start to see that is if we take the area that you call the entropy seriously and you write down the formula of this entropy quantity in units of Boltzmann constant, you see that it involves the speed of light, G Newton, and H bar. So whatever is being computed as, as an entropy ha is intimately related to the quantum nature of the black hole. So there is some quantum statistics that must happen that, le that leads to the to this thermodynamic property that we observe in black hole physics. So taking this formula already, there's quite a bit to say, to learn, and I will try to use this to motivate what I think is the current problem of quantum gravity. So if I tell you I have an entropy of some system, let's take the air in this room, I can label it by a few parameters, the temperature, the pressure, and so on. But we know that there are microstates, which is the configuration space of all of the molecules in this room. Okay? So the entropy of this of a black hole, we should also think of it as something as being the number of microstates that, that can exist behind the horizon. What are these microstates? These are the microstates that would come from some theory of gravity from some quantum structure and some quantum theory of, 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 of gravity. So this looks okay, straightforward and benign. So then let's try to put in some numbers and see what we can get. So this is where, I guess, probably we can best appreciate what the problem of quantum gravity is. 
Let's take, for example, the, the, the black hole at the center of the galaxy, Sagittarius A star. So, so you, you can plug in the mass and so on, and you get an entropy, which is sent to the 90 Boltzmann constant. So we can compare this to another number. Let's consider all the mass in the observed universe, all the energy that we think we understand. So the photons, the neutrinos, dark matter, all of those things. So these are things in quantum field, in standard quantum field theory, we know how to compute the, the entropy that they would carry. And you can compute that, you get 10 to the 89. So already, this is a, a picture that, that, that sort of emerges that the degree of freedom that lives behind the horizon is 10 times larger than the degree of freedom than all the degrees of freedom that, we, that, that, that exist in the observed universe, right? So another way to say it, there is more bits, there is more quantum, there is more bits behind the horizon than there are in all the configuration of matter and energy that we know and can observe. So that's rather dramatic, okay? So to, to push this even further, we observe about 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12 galaxies in the, just the observable universe, and these range from 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 9 solar masses. Our galaxy is about 10 to the 6 solar masses. So you could see that most, the, compared to everything, com, if, I, that if I just ask the first order, where are the degrees of freedom of the physical universe, they are behind horizons. The rest of it outside is, 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 is you know, there are several of orders of magnitude less. So also to, to, to remind you, the entropy is log of the, mic, of the number of microstates, okay? So if I exponentiate these, it's completely, completely different. So this is rather startling. We always talk about dark matter and dark energy as being things that we don't understand. But here is, a, here is one much more uh, large number to think about, which is just, what are the bits, where are the bits of the universe? Most of the bits of the universe are hidden behind horizon, or all the bits of the universe are hidden behind horizons. So this is further compounded by the fact that since LIGO, we've observed many, 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 you know, hundreds, well, order of a hundred of, uh, of, of collisions, which, of black hole collisions, which leads to even more complex uh, black holes. And even more recently, we also know that black holes have been observed as just freely floating in the Milky Way, right? There was this amazing result that just came out this year where, where by using microlensing, a freely floating black hole was, was observed. So the picture that emerges is that we have black holes at the center of Milky Way. They actually are generic objects in the universe. They're everywhere. And, and, and they carry most of the degrees of freedom of the universe, and we have no idea what they are, okay? So to this point, I will offer a reformulation of what the problem of quantum gravity is. The central problem of quantum gravity is to explain the microscopic origin of black holes, entropy. This is an urgent physical problem. Why? Because now we have conclusive evidence that black holes are generic objects in nature. Okay? So the, to, to relating to this question, the, what you would like to understand is, are black hole microstates and states of quantum gravity generally observable? Can we actually see them and observe them in a meaningful way? And this is an exciting thing to think about in, the, in, the, in a growing field where we have gravitational spectroscopy. By the time I am mid-career, there will be fancy machines that will be able to detect many more interesting ultra-compact objects. We, we will be able to have spectroscopy of these things, meaning... You can, when black holes collide, they create other black holes. But before that, these things have a ring down. So there is a spectroscopy associated with them. That spectroscopy is going to tell you about the fundamental structure of gravity that generates those things. Okay? So the era that we are now in terms of LIGO and all of these things, it is, it is similar to the era of early accelerators. Right? In the next 15 to 20 years, these will vastly be much more advanced and they'll be able to tell us a lot more about the structure of ultra-compact objects that are colliding to generate these black holes. These things that we call black holes. By the way, we shouldn't use the term black holes anymore. We should use the term ultra-compact objects because uh, it's at least better. Okay, 
So I will switch a bit. Any questions so far? Please. Yeah, so I, I, I haven't heard about these isolated three, three black holes. Yes. It's okay. And how do they show up? It's a microlensing. So it's just the, it moves in, in the foreground of another star. So there is a lensing effect. And then you see the le then you measure the you can, you measure the mass of the lens. One of the so this this observation is like took eleven years plus to even to, to even get this to get this right. So they had to measure know how the distance of the star in the back. They had to know the measure of the the distance of the lens. So there is a great deal of work which I'm not qualified to answer. And it's, but it's free in the sense that it doesn't have like yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and it's not a heavy, and it's not like, you know, these gigantic objects. This is like few solar mass object. So it's really, truly, freely floating black hole. Yeah, go ahead. So why is it possible that a black hole so many millimeter feet in my field by the horizon? Wouldn't you need this to explain the information paradox? So the... The information paradox is, is, is entirely different from this point of view. So the statement about the degrees of freedom is just saying that uh, in this small region, you have this many quant You can think of bits, information bits that, that live there. But, you know, as I just compared to you, if I take all of the matter and energy in the observable universe that's not black holes, that has less bit than the single thing. So, so certainly what it means is that standard physics, standard quantum field theory that we use to describe everything else, cannot explain what these bits are. So what is the physical, what, what, are, what is the physics that's generating those bits? So that, that is a question. What is the physics that's generate, generating those bits? We don't know. If I give you a massive particle here, I know the degree of freedom that we, we compute, we, we teach this to our students early on in thermodynamics, and, and you can write that down. So you cannot make up the bits of the black hole with that sort of an argument. Another statement to say that the Hilbert space of a quantum gravity is several times exponentially larger than the Hilbert space that you might encounter in a quantum field theory or, uh, or in theories without gravity. Good. Any more questions? Okay. I hope I have convinced you that we, there is a serious physics problem to be studied. Um, so, okay, so I will move on to this latter point on, okay, what do we know about these microstates, and what can we say uh, that might be relevant to experiments, probably, ultimately? So one thing that, that has to be the case is any quantum theory of gravity must be able to provide the, the statistical mechanics for this black hole thermodynamics. And for basically generations, we've been able to construct many supersymmetry, supersymmetric theories of gravity. And uh, the existence of black hole is a generic phenomenon of theories of gravity. So supersymmetric theories of gravity will have vast landscapes of black holes of various, in various dimensions. Why am I using supersymmetry here? Supersymmetry, you should think of, when, when, when we high energy theorists think, talk about supersymmetry, you should think of it as a sort of a um, toolbox to try to explore. It's a, it's a place where we can go, where we can control all computations, and then we can try to learn some lessons that we can take very broadly. So one thing that, that, that's been studied a lot is supersymmetric theories of, of gravity, precisely because we can control those theories in some way. And for many of these supersymmetric theories of gravity, we can actually embed them in string theories. And string theory is supposed to be a theory of quantum gravity. And indeed, in string theory, we can recover all of the degrees of freedom that we observe with some new quantum mechanical degrees of freedom from, from string theory. This was work done by Strom and Giovaffa. One of the interesting lessons that appears from here, so we want to draw lessons by studying the supersymmetric stuff, is that the quantum gravity states associated to black holes can be, even for four-dimensional spacetime, can involve higher extra dimensions and can involve fluctuations in all sort of extra dimensions that we might encounter in string theory. Okay? So there is a new picture which involves space-time where even the notion of a dimension has to be uh, acknowledged. And this is related to the fact that why I cannot use standard quantum field theory in four dimensions to explain. I need the extra degrees of freedom 
are related to the fact that you also have to have extra dimensions. Okay? So what do we mean by a microstate is the following thing. So typically, if we have a black hole, we have some horizon, then you have some singularity behind the horizon. What we mean by a microstate is some localized quantum mechanical state that's, that's, that are here. And if you are in the region out away from them, they become indistinguishable from the black hole itself. So this actually you already know, right? If I take the sun, it's a star. If I ignore the electromagnetic radiation, it looks like a black hole. I wouldn't know that there is something there until I come to the surface of the star to know that there is, a, that there is something else sitting there. When we talk about a black hole microstate, it's an object that is more compact than the horizon or at the level of the horizon. So, so that's what we mean by a microstate. There's some quantum mechanical degrees of freedom that do there, that sit there. And one other thing you might want to ask is what do these individual microstates look like and behave? And, and this is generally very hard to compute, even in the realm of string theory. However, there is some lessons we can draw. So these states with, from the string theory, they come from what we call D-brain, so ex or extended P-brain, uh, P-dimensional object. You can think of point particles. You can think of strings. You can think of extended surfaces as being physical states. And if you imagine having some surface which is sort of extended, it will have a tension, right? If I give you a sheet, the sheets have tension. You can ask, what does, how does the tension behave for, for, for these things in string theory? So you can learn some broad lessons. So tensions on D-brains is going to go as 1 over <coughs> square root of G Newton. So what this means then is in a black hole regime where you expect gravity to be very strong, the tension of the, these degrees of freedom is very, very small. But if you have a sheet with a very small tension, it becomes floppy and it sort of expands and it fills up the region of the space. This is how you can imagine how degrees of freedom that would be quantum mechanical at the horizon might sort of stretch out to fill up the region and make up uh, the black hole. So this is a sort of heuristic picture of this. So you might ask, is there, a, is there some computation that you can do to actually find things that, be, that could behave in this kind of way? And this is what leads us to what we mean by coherent states. So coherent states, you can ask, are there coherent microstates, which would be supported by various charges? So what we mean by coherent microstates is that these would be configurations of these microstates that have enough symmetry that they can be described by some classical solution. Right? So if you imagine a coherent state, think of a laser. A laser is a coherent state of photons. Right? So photons are quantum mechanical objects, but a laser I can understand in classical theory uh, in classical ENM as, 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 as a state by which I can put my system in. So one of the other things you can ask is, if I consider these microstates, which are generically quantum mechanical, I don't have the tools to describe them, are there some that are coherent enough or have enough symmetry that I can describe using the classical theory? Um, and this ans to this question, the answer is yes. So symmetric quantum states can admit classical description, and these things we, I will call topological solitons uh, for reasons that will become clearer soon. So you can ask, can I find such an object? So we go back to our little toolbox, which is super supersymmetry and supergravity, and there we can find many examples of these, of these microstates, these coherent states, which are described by geometry, and I will try to elaborate more on them. These are going to be solutions that have no horizons. Uh, they deviate from the black hole in regions where the horizon would be, so they would be completely smooth. Okay? Um, and for many, for, for, for 20 years or so, there have been a program by Banner Warner where they find these things in various supersymmetric series of gravity. Now, the key question you have to ask is do the existence of these coherent states? just require supersymmetry? Or is, this, is this just a feature of using supersymmetry that why I'm able to construct these things? Um, and if that is the case, then these things cannot ever be relevant for actually the real world because we don't have explicitly the supersymmetry. So you might ask then, can I construct these coherent configuration in non-supersymmetric theories? Can I make solitons that, that are not supersymmetric? 
So as soon as you phrase this problem, there are several hurdles that you have to overcome. And I will just tell them what they are. First, the reason why supergravity works so well to allow us to construct solutions and do all sorts of things is because the nonlinear Einstein's equation becomes simpler. Um, they become first order, and first order equations you can solve, so you can generate interesting examples of these class of solutions. Another important thing here is that when you have supersymmetry, the, 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 the fact that you have charges associated to supersymmetry means that these solutions cannot have tachyons, and they're stable both quantum mechanically and also classically. Also, um, in supergravity, when you make those, these solitons, they tend to have many ingredients of different fields and all sorts of funny things to make them happen. So all three of these things almost tells you that you should never be able to make these things in classical theories of gravity. You should just give up that, that, that this picture only makes sense for supersymmetric theories. So what you want to be able to do is you want to have a way of constructing these microstate solitons in general series of gravity, and it has to be robust. It cannot be that they exist because they have to do something very special if this has any chance to have anything to do with the real world. So we want to build solutions that are asymptotically flat. They have to be smooth and no horizons. They have to have finite energy and, uh, finite energy and definite charge, and they must be classically stable and also stable as theories in, 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 in the quantum theory. So this is a lot to ask. So as soon as re you formulate this question in this way, you go and you find that already there's quite a bit actually known. So there is a no-go theorem for solitons that goes all the way back to 1918 to 1940s uh, by Mr. Einstein himself. Because solitons in gravity was an interesting question because it's a nonlinear set of equations. So it's an interesting question to ask. And there is a no-go theorem that tells you that if you, have an if you want your things to exist in a flat space and have no topology and have no horizons, then it must be flat. Right? So already, you, this is a strong hint that if I just take 4D flat space, I should not have these solitons in series of gravity without having to add new degrees of freedom or going beyond this paradigm. So with the, but in physics, typically when you have a no-go theorem, a no-go theorem should tell you how to go beyond. Okay? And indeed, if you you can then go back to your supersymmetric construction and ask, what was the magic that allowed me to solve this? Was the magic just the magic of supersymmetry? Or is there something deeper? Is there a physical mechanism that allows me to construct these objects? And indeed, you find that the, the physical mechanism is that you have to have some interesting topology. You have to have some Maxwell field to support these, these constructions. And also, you necessarily have to have extra dimensions. Okay? So even without, in the case, in the, in the sort of like idealized supersymmetry cases, you can ask, what was the magic that, that allowed you to make these things? That magic had to do with topology and having extra dimensions. And also Maxwell type field. So then you want to try to think about these ingredients and try to see whether you could make something that could be interesting, that could, that could be interesting for what might be in the real world. Okay. So the goal is to look for, so if I have a flat space, I am required to add some extra dimensions, which I will put as circles. And this is a playground where I might be lucky to construct solitons, which I will describe uh, next. So the picture that you have is what I call a topological star. There's going to be some new degrees of freedom, which are going to be inherently topological, where they will sit there. And the way these degrees of freedom behave is what's going to generate the, the solitons that I want, which might give some hint on some aspects of degrees of freedom that, uh, uh, of, of gravity that could be coherent and, and, and realizable out there. Okay, any questions? Good. 
So from the 4D EFT, it would be a solution that is singular, which gets smoothed when you consider the higher dimensions. Yeah. So I'll try to explain this. Good. Yeah, the 4D EFT would, would, would admit these na naked singularities. And then you have to lift to the higher dimensions, and then it would be all smooth. Okay. And uh, does that violate constant temperature for some interesting way? No. That, that's a good question. It's important that it doesn't. Okay. Good. Okay, so it's going to get weirder now. Okay. So I will, I will start by talking about bubble geometries um, and, and how these things work. OK, good. So let's, let's, we start slow. Um, let's consider just space time. And we have some grid. And what do we mean when we say that there is an extra dimension that is a circle? Okay? What we mean is that there, at every single point, there is an additional loop from which I can go around. right? And the size of this loop can vary from point to point in space, and, and, and that actually behaves like an external field in, 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 in space time. So that's what we mean. And typically, when we say that you have extra dimensions that are hidden, the, the, the typical radius of, this extra, of these loops that is at every single point in space time is smaller than maybe the Planck scale, is greater than the Planck scale. Sorry. So the size of these things, in order to think about them in the classical theory of gravity, they have to be larger than the Planck scale, but they have to be smaller than any observable limit uh, that we have in physics. The current bounds on the size of extra dimensions is like 10, t 10 TeV, uh, whereas the Planck mass is at 10 to the 19 uh, uh, GeV. So there is a huge room where we can actually have extra dimensions in the real world that are, that are reasonably large. So the, the thing that I want to consider is the following scenario. Let's, let's, let's go, what happens when I collapse extra dimensions, when I, when I collapse compact dimensions in space? Something very funny happens, uh, which is, let's consider just a one-dimension line, so just a one-dimensional world. And then we add to this one-dimensional world a circle, an extra dimension, which is a circle. So that will give you a cylinder. So the size of this circle changes along my r direction. And in some region, it can collapse to 0. Okay? So what happens when that, when that happens? So I can fluctuate the size of the extra dimension. And as I fluctuate them, at some point, I can collapse it to 0. Something funny has happened here when I go from this to this. I had one piece, and I ha now I have two pieces. Things that are labeled by integers are topological. Okay. So one, I have one cylinder, now I have two pieces. So there is a topological transition that happened when I collapsed this extra dimension down. So notice that here, uh, when I talk about this space, I just have two pieces. There is no meaningful way of talking about what this region is inside here. Okay. So this is now in one dimension. Let's say, let's do it in two dimensions. Okay. So let's, 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 in higher dimensions, we can consider a circle, which also is pinching off. So let's consider a two dimensions now like this. So this was the picture before that I had along one dimension. Now, in two dimensions, something else, something funny happens. So here I just create, when I collapse the size of the circle, I just create two disconnected objects. Okay? So in higher dimensions, if, if I consider a 2D space, 2D sheet with a circle that sits on top that can collapse in various regions, something funny, different, something different is going to happen. So here I, I try to show this by taking, since I have this circle and I have the extra 2D spaces, I can look at what is happening at the circle at, at antipodal points, one at theta equal to zero and another at, at theta equal to pi. So in the 1D picture, that would be looking at this line and that line. Okay. So if I allow now the extra dimension to collapse, what I would generate here is the two sheets which are glued along a handle. Okay? So the, the sheet at theta equal to 0 and theta equal to pi are going to be connected through a handle. 
Meaning if I'm walking around here on this two dimensional space, I come all the way to a place where the circle shrink, I just continue without knowing anything better to the other sheet at theta is equal to pi. But now notice what I've done. In doing so, I've created a hole in the space, right? But this hole is not very meaningful. And the way we talk about this hole is to say that now my space have a region of, of non-trivial topology, okay? So this is a, something which is of different topology from the cylinder. Now I have a space where I have a region where I ho have a hole in the space, but the presence of this hole is just a handle, right? So I have something which has non-trivial topology, okay? So if you do the same thing in, let's say, in three dimensions of space, right? So now I cannot perceive such a hole in space, but what I would get is I would walk down, I would come to the region where this extra dimension has collapsed, and the space would just smoothly end. And beyond that, there is no meaningful physical world to talk about. In the same sense that if I go back to this picture here, oh, sorry. If I go back to this picture here, if I am a person that lives on this world and I just walk down here, I can walk around and I, walk, I can walk around here, but I will never have a way of actually seeing that there is a hole, except all that I know is that the space has ended and I can turn back around. So because we live in a 3D space, we are like the person, the ant that lives on the 2D world, we cannot perceive something that looks like a hole, but what we will perceive what we would see is a bubble. We would come in, and then there would be a bubble where the space-time has ended, and, and that's what you would see, and then you can come in and walk back out. Okay? Is, is, that, is that clear? And this would be a region where the extra dimension, the extra circle, has collapsed to zero size. Okay? Any questions about this picture? Very good. Stefan read some papers. <laughs> Sorry, I've known Stefan for a while, so we have a fun back and forth. <laughs> so this thing is, is known as, it, when, when, when this thing exists, it's known as, what's, what's known as the uh, bubble of nothing. And it's been known for a while, back in the 80s. And in fact, it's an instability that exists whenever you have extra dimensions. Whenever you have extra dimensions, you have this instability where you can have these bubbles that nucleate, and they literally delete all of space-time. Right? Because beyond this region, there is no meaningful physical space-time. There is nothing in the purest definition of nothing. If you have just a vacuum space with no energy and matter, these things could actually be nucleated in, a, in, a, in, 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 in Kaluza-Klein theories. And when they are nucleated, they just expand and they delete all of space-time. So it's a very dramatic way to end the world. And they expand at the speed of light. And, and you could study it at many ways. But there are ways to make sure that these things, don't dis that these things are stable when you have extra dimensions. One of the ways that Witten had showed is that if you have a physical universe with fermions, you can have extra dimensions, and you have fermions in your theory. Somehow, the very fact that you have, you have, your vacuum have fermions can forbid these, these objects, which is dramatic. Go ahead. So is there any specific reason why they would expand and not collapse? Both can happen. It's a thermodynamic process, right? So you, you can imagine a vacuum where these fluctuations are happening, just water boiling, right? It's literally that, but some of them will collapse, and some of them will expand. But the ones that expand, they, they're, they're like the delete button of, of, of physical reality. Or you can be very poetic with it, of course. <laughs> you know. um, so yeah, so, so these things exist. And you can construct these solutions, and you can see how fast they expand, and so on and on. Um, one of the things that we've figured out, so in, in supersymmetric theories, when we make those, those uh, solitons, they're actually made from these bubbles. But there, they're stable because the theory has fermions, and also there is magnetic flux. So one way you can stabilize these things is you can add a magnetic flux. Right? There, is a f there is a way to add magnetic flux on these things, and this is one of the things that we figured out, is that if you add magnetic flux and have them radiate like monopoles, 
then the, you will find a class of solutions that are completely stable that don't want to expand and eat away all of space-time. Okay, so that's, that was exciting. And in fact, so this was a paper that I wrote with this really awesome postdoc that I have, Pierre Heidman, who was a PRL a couple of years ago. The, space, the metric is very, for, for the experts in the room, the space-time of this metric is very simple. It just involves something that looks, so if I look at this piece and that, that just looks like a Schwarzschild space-time, and I add this extra circle sitting here where I have these Schwarzschild, standard Schwarzschild functions and what, with two parameters, RS and RB. And in these cases, when RS is greater than RB, then the function FS is going to shrink first, and then you have a horizon, you have something that looks like a standard black hole. When RB is greater than RS, you here, then you have the extra dimension is going to shrink first, and then you have these bubble geometries. So they already are there. And then studying this physics and showing that these things ha are, are doing exactly what we want is the, the, the paper that we wrote here. Okay? So we can say, I can say a little bit about, more about these things. So for example, you can calculate, so in the, in the real world, they're going to be, look like some localized object sitting there with some mass and some charge. You can calculate the monopole charge, is given in terms of this parameter, then you can calculate their masses, which is given in terms of uh, the parameters. Here, Ry is the size of the extra dimension very far away, right? It's the asymptote, you know, you, you want to fix the asymptotic data. Part of fixing the asymptotic data is fixing the size of the extra dimension. So that's, that's, that's a parameter in your theory. So you can write down the mass. So what you observe already is that uh, the RB, which was the size of this bubble, has to be less than the, the diameter, has to be less than the size of the extra dimension that I would observe far away. But we know extra dimensions are very compact and they should be very small. So this actually looks like a topological particle than an actual big soliton that I would want to have and try to look for in the universe. So, so but, but, but still, you can ask, what, what does this particle look like? Um, so if you just become very conservative, take extra dimensions to be as small as they want, you find that these things will have very large mass, like 10 to the 21 times the mass of the proton. While on the other hand, if you look at their radius, they're ultra, ultra compact objects, right? So these are examples of particle-like objects that are ultra compact, but very, very heavy, okay? So there's many interesting things you can try to do with such a particles, uh, but the key thing that I want to think about is whether I can put these things in some complicated bound state to make something large that can sit there, right? If I, can I make something? Already having a new, ob, new class of objects that look like particles is interesting, and we can, all, of course, discuss a lot about that, but I will take, I'll go a different direction. I'll try to ask, can I make a bound state of these things, and what should that look like? So this had been basically a, a, a chain of papers that we wor worked out uh, uh, recently, by assuming space times that are, for example, axially symmetric, what we're able to do is the following: is we had this thing where we, where, where basically the particle had to have a small radius. Another thing you can try to do is you can do you can play a game where you have two extra dimensions, and you imagine having a region where you, where you sort of collapse and re-expand these extra dimensions. You collapse and re-expand these extra dimensions in, in a picture like that. Whenever you can do that, you would create a series of bubble which can be large, which can have a size that is larger than the extra dimensions outside. And ultimately, what you do when you do this is you create what I will call a topological star. And one thing you can then finally do is you can take a, huge, a very long chain of these things and create a very large bubbly structure with all sorts of degrees of freedom where the, the, the data associated with the degrees of freedom is associated to how these extra, these extra dimensions are shrinking and growing and shrinking and growing. Okay, any questions?
it's a, of Einstein Maxwell. Yeah, that, that was the point, because it has charge. Yeah, it's, it has to be Einstein Maxwell, and, and that's, that's like the basic ingredient that I need. Um, I, a Maxwell field, GR, and an extra dimension. Okay? So the geometry that's constructed in this chain, you can think of this as, as basic, you can build this by having some, some, some sort of magnetic domain, which are actually like monopoles, that you sort of glue together in a long chain. Right, so the question is, can I make such ex explicit space-time? And we were able to figure out how to construct such explicit space-time, which sort of glues together these, these magnetic domains, which is exactly like gluing this bubbling structure on, along, along, along an axis. Okay? So, for example, in the simplest case here, there is a gluing condition, which fixes, for example, the ratio of mass to charge. So you can associate a mass to each one of these segments, meaning individual smaller degrees of freedom, and they have some charge. In the case where you have their mass to charge ratio is fixed, you can construct a solution where in the equilibrium that it sits there, the average mass, the typical mass is given by the number of these particles that I put together, right? They have a very, they can have a ADM mass or the mass that I would see from the outside which will scale with the number of these particles. So I can make it big and large. And they will carry some charges in, the, in my theory. Um, these objects, you can calculate their radius, and they're going to be always ultra-compact, meaning their sizes are less than twice their, their short shield. So if you take a short shield black hole of the same mass, these things are smaller than twice the, their short shield radius, which show that these are ultra-compact objects that you might think of. For example, the neutron star, which are made of degrees of freedom of quarks, are about order two times their short shield radius. Okay? So there are some quantum effects that sort of keeps a bound of how, how, how small these rods can be. So there's a quantum effect that actually gives you a maximum size. So if I take into account of those quantum effects, then actually the, these this way, I can make an object that is as large as like an asteroid size uh, 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 object that could be there. Go ahead. Can you give me some quick calculations for why asteroid size? What sets the absolute bound? I mean, it sounds like an asteroid. So the thing that sets the absolute bound, so, so I'm, I'm solving a solution in the classical theory of gravity, but if I now have these, so, so the point is that I'm putting these particles together, they're bubbling structure. So as I stack them more, they squeeze each other. But if they squeeze themselves to be small enough, there would be, and they come near the Planck scale, I shouldn't trust the solution anymore. So here you can see that as they squeeze themselves, right, their masses are scaling as one over n to the minus three fourths. So the more particles that I have, the more squeezes, the more squeeze they, they, that they are. At some point, they'll be so small that I can't trust the solution. And that's what's really is setting this bound. Okay, so, 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 so it's really, you should think of these, these rods as really elementary quantum gravity degrees of freedom that have a classical description. And I'm just putting them together to, to do this. And there is a bound to how much I can put them together before I cannot trust the classical theory anymore. There are ways that we figured out to, to lift these bounds but uh, I, I, I don't think I'll be able to say much about them here. Okay, so what, what else can I tell you? So these, 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 these constructions are, are quite interesting. So putting it this way, it feels like that, you know, you might imagine then this would be something that is very elongated and, and will not look spherical and looks very weird with a very, very large dipole and so on and on. Something surprisingly funny happens, and here I will describe a metric, is... You can, you can look at this and you, you try to understand the region immediately outside the surface. So this, you take R greater than 2M, where 1 plus order of this. Just, uh, just, just take an epsilon neighborhood outside this region. What you find is that the space-time dramatically simplifies, and it looks like this metric. So now if you look at this metric, there is a deviation from being spherically symmetric, which is here. And you can see that deviation is not going to show up because it's coming from here until you are very, very close. So actually, this thing, uh, this is one of those weird fluke, weird 
effects of general relativity where you can have a region that can have extreme warpings of various kinds. But if you just move away a little bit, you get something that looks very much spherically symmetric. So meaning you wouldn't know that such a structure is sitting there until you come right on it. From outside, all you would see is a, something that looks like a black hole, and you wouldn't know that, that there is this weird object sitting there until you come right on it, which is, which is sort of dramatic. And when you come right on it, then it sort of just opens up, becomes this elongated thing. So I can try to tell, give you a bit more. So one of the things that we plotted here is that you take just the sphere, a big sphere that surrounds such an object, and then let's just start shrinking it and, and see what, how, what, and just start to shrink it down. And by looking at the area, what you observe is that the area will come down as basically 1 over r squared, as you might expect. And then it will hit at, at some region when the radius r over 2m is like order 1, it just opens up. And then once you cross here, it just, just opens up to this gigantic bubbly structure that's, that's, that's sitting there. And, and this metric that I use to describe it, it becomes quite accurate. So the dotted line is the metric, and then the, the orange line is the explicit solution that we construct. So this metric is obviously singular. You can see that it comes very close to describing this geometry at a region that is 1.00004. So you wouldn't know that you have some complicated object sitting there. All that you would think is that there is a black hole until you come right on the surface, which is rather dramatic, and then you have a big region. So we refer to these things as, as back-end space-time, meaning you have an asymptotically flat space, then you come down, and then there is some mouth here that opens up, and inside you have a very big region that opens up. So we call it a back-end space-time to mimic uh, uh, this, this cool. So, so, so and, 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 and this, this minimal radius that sits here would be the typical place where you would expect a horizon. Okay? So it's, so it's sort of dramatic that such a structure could actually be constructed in just classical theories of gravity with, with minimal ingredients. Another thing we were able to figure, so, so, so far, uh, at least in the case of, t, of, of these solutions here, um, all of these have some magnetic charge, right? We don't observe magnetic charges for, for objects, or if we do, it's very, very small. So you could ask, can you make something that is actually neutral? So this is some, th we recently figured this out with me, Pierre, and a student of mine who's really great, that you can actually construct a system where you have a bubble which, which have no charge that corresponds to one circle shrinking. And then you can have a bubble with opposite charges that are sitting together. So this will be neutral from far away, and it looks like a short shield. So this is the first example of a sort of ultra-compact object that looks like a short shield ever. Right? So there, there is neutron star, but neutron star carry, can carry charges. But this is an example of something that could, that could mimic a short shield that you wouldn't know that it's a short shield until you come very, very close. The only additional thing that could be that it has a magnetic dipole moment, so it would be a standard magnetic field, so you wouldn't be able to distinguish it from, from standard things. There is a nice description we have of this in string theory, but at this point, uh, um, if anyone wants to ask me about it, I can tell them. So usually, for example, you know, so why are these things hard to get, right? So for us to get these things, we had to sort of develop a whole sorts of framework. We had to take the nonlinear equations of Einstein, and then we had to show we, what we discovered is that there's some integrable structure that can exist in the nonlinear equation of Einstein's equation. And then once we understood the integrable structure, we were able to construct these things. But the upshot is we can write a complete metric to describe all of these objects. For example, this guy here, I can give you a transparency of what the space-time looked like. So if you've ever played with metrics, this, is, this looks pretty scary. If you haven't played with metrics, this looks very scary. Okay? <laughs> uh, but, but the key point is that we can be quite explicit and fully describe these geometries and fully describe these, these objects so you can actually take them and study them and try to play with them. Okay? So, so, so just some outlook. So, so okay, so I'll, I'll stop here. So the many interesting questions emerge. So what is the general space of these non-supersymmetric solitons and these non-supersymmetric topological stars, as I like to call them? 
Um, what, where, do they, where do I find them in string theory? How can I use string theory to better understand how these things emerge and how they may emerge in nature? So as I said, there is an integrable structure that allowed me to extend them. So there is a very exciting question of why GR have these integrable structures. So gravity is one of those, general relativity is one of those theories where when there is an answer, there, that's because something special has happened. So understanding what is special that is happening that allows for these solitons to exist is a very exciting question. And then, as, as, as I claim, these things are non-supersymmetric, and you can ask, are they, could I actually see these things in the sky? Could I see them in gravitational, um, in, in gravitational wave collisions? Um, can I say something about their phenomenology? And so on. And there is also a question of stability, right? So, so this is probably the most important thing. If I could come up with a mechanism of making these things, and we have some ideas how to do that, why do I think they would be stable? How long should they live? And so on. So there are many interesting physical questions to sort of ask. OK? So now I will end with here. So, so to just end where I started, my, the initial thing that motivated me to look at this is because there is this huge world that's opening up in astronomy. And it was an interesting question for me to ask. Can't these machines find anything interesting that I could care about? But then soon realized there was nothing interesting that, that, that was made that these machines could find. So we spent a few months thinking about what could happen, and we were able to find all of this interesting structure. And probably these will not be show up in nature because, because that's just what theoretical physics is. <laughs> I mean, the first order, anything you do will never matter. But, but the fact that with some work, we're able to find this, this, this interesting structure, which warrants, you know, to, 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 research, to search more, just means that, we, you know, the fact that we're entering a new era where we have two amazing machines that are coming up to the sky, these are machines that are going to push what we mean by fundamental physics and new observables, right? So, so away from all of the weird bubbly stuff that I talk about, the takeaway here is to sort of just motivate you that we are entering a new era in science, and we are going to be discovering things, right? And the things that you, that, that you think we know, we don't, right? There are very few candidates. These, these machines are going to see all sorts of weird stuff out there in the sky, and we have no framework to tell you what those things are, okay? So my motivation is to actually start in that direction. What sort of weird things could these machines do? And the fact that we've been doing string theory for a long time, it is sort of amazing the wealth of knowledge that we already have, wealth of understanding we have of gravity, is a perfectly legitimate time to ask, can I take all of the crazy things that I learned from string theory, from supergravity, from all these supersymmetric things, not the specific thing, but just understand the phenomena that allows for these things to exist, and can I apply those phenomena to the real world, and can I actually make some predictions of what these machines will see. So it's exciting. If you're a student, this is a very exciting time. So I'll stop there. Good. So we, so we haven't figured out a way to make them spin properly. We have solutions of angular momentum, but they're, they're, they have some pathologies. So that's a very good question. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So we can, we can turn on angular momentum, but, but then there is a non-trivial balancing act. We have many examples of the, that, are, that, 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 that have angular momentum, but they have some physical pathologies, which we haven't been able to resolve, but hopefully we will resolve those. Good. <laughs> Good. Yes. Yes. So. So. What, so. So. I. I didn't. So. There's many things 
many different slides that I can elaborate on fully. So the thing that gravitational wave detectors are going to see is they're going to see a spectroscopy of compact object, meaning, meaning if, I may, if I have two collisions... So, so, okay, there are two things that are important. So when, 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 the two, when the two objects are coming to collide, there's some deformability that happens. So, so if, if I look at, for example, the wave front of these gravitational wave thing, uh, things, there is information about the deformability of those incoming objects that are going to be encoded in that wave front. And that's what we call the love numbers ab about them. So that's, that, that's going to be an observable in the next few years, in the next few decades. And then when these things collide, there's a ring down to a final state. So b before you get to that final state, there's this, this thing is going to radiate away all of this excess energy. And, and there, are, there are normal modes associated to that radiation, which we call quasi-normal modes. So the, the ring down of the, of, the, of the gravitational wave is going to also encode that. But so to, to quasi-normal, so currently with, with even O3 run of LIGO, right, we, we don't have, the resolution isn't good enough to, see, to start seeing the first modes on top of the zeros. So we can measure the mass, the angular momentum, but you need higher modes to start to see these higher, higher states. But when you start to see these higher modes, then you can distinguish, for example, a black hole from something else. You can, you know, in, in, one place where this is very interesting in the study of neutron star and trying to understand the equation of state of a neutron star. So these ring downs are, people, are things people try to study to understand, to try to constrain the equation of state of, of, of a neutron star. For ultra compact objects that are not black holes, if there are any objects that's not black holes, we will know in the next uh, 15 years. That's exciting. So if there are any compact objects that are not neutron star and not black holes, we will know. And if all we see is just black holes from this ring down, that's also very interesting, right? So, 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 so it'll be interesting either way. So, okay, so the, the photon ring will shift around. So, 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 uh, the, so my, my postdoc have really nice pictures where he tries to describe the photon ring of these things. So you can calculate the photon rings. You can see that they're, they're going to be different. Yeah, so there are several observables that you can look. So the solutions, the, 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 the neutral guy, which, which I showed in the end, had a... Although it's short year like it has a dipole moment, both a gravitational and a, and a magnetic dipole moment, right? So, so that's going to be an observable that's going to distinguish it. So there's a list of things that you, that you try to look for. But, you know, but part of the, but, but so far, all of these construction, you know, they're, they're made, all of these construction, the thing that we learn is that when we make them, they really want to be very, very compact. And this is, I think, some feature of gravity, which I don't think I fully appreciate or, un or understand. They don't want to be like huge and, and outlandish. They really want you to work hard to, to tell them they're different from black holes, right? So the fact that now we start to see all sorts of weird things is very exciting. Right? It means that, you know, there's a, there's a chance that we'll see something weird that, is not, that does not look like the black hole in GR, in which case I would bet my money we might be learning something about fundamental physics. Good. So there's a, there's a, so part of talking about the merger, something that, good. So, so you can certainly ask what happens when two of these things collide. So naturally, when anything, when any object collide, they usually want to make a black hole singularity. So what is the final state of such a thing? I, I, I don't know. So I'm very curious to, 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 to trying to at least figure out how to model those. But there is a other question related to this. How could these things be made in nature, right? Because they're actually quantum mechanical. To make these things requires some quantum transition, right? So how could, the, how could this be made? So we have some, some, we have some game that we play by thinking about them and by taking some ensemble. So, so one thing that we were able to show in a paper um, a year ago is that if you study some ensemble where you have black holes of, of some charges, you can actually show that these things can, can, can experience some quantum transition to these bubbles. So black holes themselves can quantum transition to these bubbles, small, small black holes. 
So you can imagine a process where you have in a very early universe where you have large density fluctuations, where you would basically populate black holes that can transition to these bubbles, which could be long-term and live. So we're trying to flush out the details of this story. What do you mean fermions? I mean, fermions, what they, the fact that fermions exist, they actually help in stabilizing these things. No, because, no, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so fermions are, are, are finicky beasts in physics, right? Um, in a sense that, you know, not any theory will admit fermions. There is something we call spin structure that you have to pick, and spin structure is more of a topological property of theories than, than actual local things. So when you have... You know, so when you have a theory of fermions, you have to pick spin structure. Picking spin structure is like telling me how the fermion should behave near these geometries in this context. So this will either rule out some of them or will protect some of them. So, and it, and it just matter which system you're looking at. So in principle, it's possible to Yeah, 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 yeah. You can put, the, you can, you're allowed to have other stuff around. I mean, supersymmetric theories, oh, yeah, yeah. you have them. Go ahead. So you so there are pure states, so they you wouldn't they wouldn't carry so there's no Hawking radiation, but but they could sort of they could radiate. You could ask, can I deform these things so the, from the quasi normal modes? So actually in the for this so for a while we thought these things couldn't have quasi normal modes because they looked very very pure. But actually in some range of their masses, you can actually hit them and they will shake and then and then there is some, some gravitational wave radiation associated with them. So they don't Hawking radiate, because Hawking radiation is a feature of the thermodynamics of having a horizon. Right? Horizons Hawking radiate, but these things aren't horizons. Fifteen. So, or, uh, well, okay, fifteen is. So, because uh, there is a cosmic wave, ex there, is a, there is a cosmic explorer that's going to go up, yeah. the Einstein telescope. I mean, fifteen is too optimistic, maybe twenty to thirty, thirty years or so. Go ahead. Yes, that's right. So, so there are some papers now trying to say that. The, that with the current LIGO data, you can see quasi normal modes. I don't believe them. I don't think they're correct. Um, but, 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 but this is from run three, right? The people are trying to see. But, but you know, by the time we go to what? So, so, so Cosmic Explorer and Einstein Telescope are based on LIGO plus plus, right? And then, they, and then they build from those. So those guys are going to be able to see quasi normal modes very clearly, very sharply. And, and that's exciting for me. Yes. No, so, so, so that was how, how far can I distinguish them from the singular solution? So, so, so meaning that, I, yeah, good. So, it, so that singular solution is a single solution with a horizon, but it's a, it's a horizon where there's a singularity at the horizon. Oh, so, so, right, so, so there is how distinguishable they are from, from that horizon, from that solution with the horizon. The statement about the masses Good. So, l l l so, okay. So, you know GR, so I can be more specific. Okay. So, if I look at this solution here, um, maybe is this the one that I want? Yeah. So, this this solution here um, is going to be singular at r equal to two m. It's a curvature singularity. Okay. But the point is that this curvature singularity is is just an artifact of having 
thought of averaging over the degree of the freedom, right? And, and it's just a feature of, of, of just like looking what the metric looks like. But, but the point is that as soon as you come to near this region, the space time opens up to this other thing. And, and, and you, there is a more sharper way to understand it. The reason why is that from the 4D space, there is this minimal surface. So it is, it is, it is as if telling you the limit where you would need to add new degrees of freedom to continue the space time. So this is just telling you what the meshing looks like right outside that mouth. And then there is new stuff coming to, 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 the, to the other end. So yeah, so the, their, their size is, is so so here. This is not this m is not exactly the mass. It's a it's a it's a mass with some correction. So the I mean, so this m is a parameter in the thing, but the the mass is given in terms of this, but also involves the radii of the extra dimensions and, and 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 other stuff. The point is that if I get that mass and ask what is the black hole that have the same mass, that uh, and I compare it to that, so 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 that black hole will have some short shield radius. And the size of this thing is going to be about up to twice. It'll be, you know, so, so we, we're able to get it to be 1.5. We're able to shrink it even further. We can, get, we can construct various examples. That's what I mean. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's thank you, Ibu, uh, again for a very nice talk. Thank you.